Library Museum. My name is Tom Schwartz. I'm director. Those who heard Matt Heron this morning uh, know what a treat he was. Uh, interesting fellow, and uh, you're in for an equally uh, pleasant uh, treat. And uh, this afternoon with Elizabeth Partridge. Um, before I do my introduction of Elizabeth, let me just uh, make two shameless plugs. First of all, if you're not a member of the uh, Hoover Presidential Foundation, um, there are membership applications at the desk outside, uh, and you might want to think about uh, picking it up and taking it home and think about joining. Um, the Hoover Foundation uh, provides the support for programs such as these in our education programs and also for the exhibits. So uh, we couldn't do any of that, uh, with those programs, without their support. Uh, also, being a member allows you free admission. And so uh, if you plan on coming to future programs, this might be uh, a good investment for you. Uh, I've had the very great pleasure of uh, spending um, some dinner and, and lunch with, with Elizabeth Partridge and finding out about her and she of course finding out about me but um, to relate all of her wonderful accomplishments and uh, fascinating career uh, would be the program. And so uh, let me just say uh, she pioneered the field of women's studies at the University of California, Berkeley, getting a graduate degree uh, kind of, of her own making, uh, creating the, the, the field. Uh, then she left, went to England and studied um, acupuncture and homeopathic medicine, came back uh, as a licensed practitioner and for the next two decades uh, uh, brought acupuncture uh, uh, to the United States, which is now kind of a, a commonly accepted uh, uh, treatment uh, for, for many of us. Uh, she then took a detour into writing uh, and that's why we're here today. Uh, her most recent endeavor uh, is both a uh, special that's going to be aired on uh, the American Experience uh, with PBS, and it also has a handsome uh, companion book, Dorothea Lang, uh, Grab a Hunk of Lightning, Her Lifetime in, in Photography. Uh, Elizabeth has firsthand uh, experience having uh, and grown up uh, with the, having frequent interaction with Dorothea Lang and uh, I'll let you her explain that connection but uh, for those of you who don't know who Dorothea Lang is she's probably the preeminent uh, documentary photographer photographer of the Great Depression if you go in our galleries Many of the most iconic images that we have blown up were done by Dorothy Lang. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Elizabeth Partridge. Hello, everybody. First of all, let me just say thank you uh, to the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum for having me here. I'm thrilled to be here. And I want to especially thank Elizabeth Dinchell, who invited me. And <coughs> she's the education specialist. We did two days uh, working with teachers, coming up with curriculum stuff on Dorothea and the Great Depression. And uh, Tom Schwartz, <coughs> thank you for your introduction and for having me. And of course, Lynn Smith, who is like the fearless tech person that we all need. <laughs> we certainly, I do. So what we're going to do is show you a half an hour of the film that we're going to have on American Masters, which is a PBS uh, program. It will be showing on Friday, August 29th. It's nearly a two-hour show, the whole thing. We are right now in the process of just finishing everything about it. So what you're going to see is like a rough cut. 
So you'll see there will be some numbers running along the bottom of things. And at the very beginning, the sound quality isn't really good on this. But don't despair. It gets a lot better. Because you're going to think, oh my god, I can't hear this. It's, um, it's a little uh, muffled at first. It's something that we're working on right now to get fixed. All right. I'm going to go ahead and play you this half an hour. Okay. So I'm Elizabeth Partridge. I wrote the companion volume, Dorothea Lang, Grab a Hunk of Lightning, to go with the film that's going to be showing on uh, American Masters. So these are um, a few of the books that I've been writing. And um, I'm Dorothea Lang's goddaughter. And Dorothea's granddaughter, Diana Taylor, is the one who made the film that you just saw. And Diana took, it took a number of years for her to get the funding together to do the film. In fact, it took seven years where she repeatedly kept, you know, putting together various appeals for money. And eventually, she got the money together. All the time that she was doing that, um, I would say to her, Dee, I tell you what. When you get your funding together, I'll write the companion volume for you. And finally, I got a call. OK, I have the money to make the film. Get going on the book. I had done a book previously on Dorothea. This is a children's book, Restless Spirit. It's for like about fifth through seventh graders. Um, it's a biography of Dorothea, um, told particularly with the interest of what children would find interesting about her life and her struggles. So I was really eager to do more of a photo book, which is this companion volume, and one that's also more geared towards adults. So I slid into gear. Now, I grew up with my grandmother, Imogen Cunningham. And Imogen was what they call a fine arts photographer. She did beautiful photographs like this, Magnolia Blossom. She also photographed her kids quite a bit. Um, these are her twins, Ron and Patrick. Uh, one of them is my dad, but I do not know which one. <laughs> they were very, very identical. They took quite a bit of pleasure in fooling people about which one was which. That was one of their little jokes they like to play on people. A little, when they get a little bit older, I can tell them apart by their posture, and my dad can look back at the photographs and tell them apart by their freckle patterns. <laughs> so this is my grandmother when I knew her. She was um, very much a San Francisco bohemian person. So back when Dorothea first came to San Francisco looking for a chance to start her own life as a young adult, my grandfather met her when she'd only been there about a week. And he said, you know, you're a great young woman. I, you've got to come over to our house for dinner. So within a few more days, she was over having dinner with my family. And gradually, they became what they called family friends. And Dorothea started by starting her portrait studio in San Francisco. But she was very compelled by what was happening on the streets around her to see what was going on. And this is a very early photograph she did that uh, many of you may know, White Angel Breadline. That's named after the White Angel who had the woman they had the nickname the White Angel because every day she fed long lines of homeless, unemployed, hungry men. The women were more likely to go to a, uh, an interior space and get a bag of food that needed to be prepared. So when you look at these photos of the Great Depression, often the people in the bread lines are almost exclusively men. And then, of course, she did Migrant Mother, which is her most famous image and really the our icon of the Great Depression. Well, when my dad was 17, he decided he wanted to be a photographer just as his mother was. And so Imo sent him off to work first with Ansel Adams and then next with Dorothea Lange. Because it was a small world back then. They all knew each other. So off, she went, off he went, and he started working with Dorothea, and they really clicked. So he would drive her on the streets, he would pack her camera bag, he'd reload her film. When they got home, he'd unload everything, he'd cook. My dad's a great cook. There was just plenty that he found of ways to be useful to her. So what Dorothea would do is go out into the field where the migrants were, and she'd start by photographing one of the kids who immediately came up to her. She did this not because she wanted this posed photograph of 
of the child standing straight in front of her. But because she knew that while she was doing this, the adults were kind of peering out at her from the tents, and she was beginning her process of establishing a rapport with them. It also, as she said, it helped because she had polio when she was seven, and she walked with a noticeable limp. And she said that it helped that she had had polio because when she went into a situation like this, it wasn't that she was, as she said, whole. She wasn't. She'd been struck down by adversity that was completely out of her control. And the migrants could see that, and they recognized that she understood adversity as they did and would be much less likely to judge her. Dorothea photographed children absolutely beautifully after they got through the closed stage. Um, and then she used this her tremendous ear to do captions and also to put information in with the photo. This photograph, when she submitted it to Roy Stryker at the, at the um, Farm Security Administration, this was her caption. Hop Harvesting o Oregon. This boy, age 11, and his grandmother work side by side picking hops. Started work at 5 a.m. Photograph was made at noon. Temperature, 105. Yeah. And, and he's so, you know, you look at that kid's hair, the way he's got it optimistically combed back. So when I do uh, school visits or talk to groups of kids, I often show them this photograph and say, so, you think school gets kind of boring once in a while? <laughs> Could be out picking hops with your grandmother. <laughs> That'd be a lot rougher. Dorothea also photographed, we know her best for her Dust Bowl photography and what she did in California, but she went through the Deep South several times for weeks and weeks at a time photographing. And um, Roy Stryker asked her to, um, he sent her in a letter, he said to, please stop photographing so many Negroes and photograph more white people because um, he could get more sympathy with the photographs of white people. So being Dorothea, she began photographing more African Americans. <laughs> <laughs> so this is um, a, a photograph titled, Ex-Slave with a Long Memory. Yeah, maybe there's a lot in that title, isn't there? It's beautiful. So this is, here she is, standing talking to this woman, but she also did this beautiful photograph of the woman's hands. She loved to photograph details that made, that symbolized that person to her. And as you heard in the film, she also thought it was very important how you moved out of taking a photograph, gave you a lot of information about the main photograph. Here's the woman after they talked, walking back to where she lives. <coughs> and if you look at this photograph long enough, you start noticing a few things. Of course, at first you notice that the roof is falling down, but then you notice, wow, there's only footpaths to this house. There's no car here. This woman only walks to get where she's going. And the, the detail I find so touching in this is far over on the right side of the screen is the bedding hanging out airing that this woman's doing her best to live where she can, as she can. One of the things I challenged myself to do in putting together this book was um, add some photographs in that had never been seen or almost never been seen, just to add to the general range of photographs of Dorothea's that are out in the world. And this is one I completely fell in love with this. It's a cotton picker who has paid very, very poorly in the Deep South. I, I just, it really shows you how Dorothea could um, get a rapport going with just about anyone. You know, here she is, this much older white woman, and this African American worker at lunchtime is just sitting absolutely still, honestly looking at her. It's just so beautiful. So I paired this photograph. In a book, you're always going to pair, you always have to worry about the page spread. As you open the book, there may be two photographs, or one in a blank page, or one that goes page and a half, but you always worry about the page spread. You can't put two photographs there that don't go together. I paired her with this young white sharecropper 
because again, he's so still in front of the camera. I just love the two of them together. I thought they were beautiful. And then Dorothea did go on to work for the War Relocation Authority after the war, um, photographing the internment of the Japanese Americans, which, as she said in the film, I did not have a comfortable feeling about that job. She was now in opposition to what the government was doing, whereas before she had been in agreement with the goals of the government in creating the photographs. But now she photographed for her own reasons, which was that she wanted to show the incredible suspension of civil liberties. And that was not why the government wanted her photograph. They wanted to show it was a humane process. So it was very stressful for her. This is one of my favorite photographs of that period of time. Um, a child's face, uh, the little girl, is just, oh, the melancholy in that face is amazing. And then that tag, and to imagine losing your name and becoming a number. You know, we, we count on being our name. And, you know, here's a great example of just losing absolutely everything. And in her left hand is a little sandwich. That was, there were some white women who came and uh, gave internees who wanted them a sandwich because they understood that it was going to be a very, very long day, which the Japanese Americans, they could only take with them what they could carry. So a few other things were sent uh, by you know, moving storage, but they only each got one bag, and so they hadn't brought a lot of food, but maybe none. So then she photographed the whole process. These are um, internees lined up. Here's the beginning of school. They started school with these kids immediately uh, for a couple reasons. One, they didn't want them just running around. They wanted to like get them uh, working together and getting them together. They also needed to make sure they understood the rules, which were um, things like watch out for rattlesnakes and scorpions, which they didn't know what they were, and stay away from the barbed wire fences or you will risk being shot. So they had to make sure they taught the children. All the children knew the rules right away. So then, um, you know, Dorothea went through this very long period of terribly bad health. And towards, like, the late 1950s, Paul Taylor was um, asked to go around the world doing various uh, USAID things. And Dorothea, he wanted Dorothea to go with him. And she really didn't know if her health could stand up to it. So she went to her doctor and said, you know, should I go? Should I stay? And he says to her, what does it matter whether you die here or there? Go. <laughs> <laughs> so off she went. So now her photography took on a very different look. Because for the first time, she had no idea what was going on. Because they were moving from country to country. She didn't know if there was a cotton strike coming. She didn't know what the processes that people were going through. So her photography became very lyrical and very beautiful. And she began exploring using her eye in all new ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a very different photograph for her. Um, she was obsessed with legs because of her polio, to the point that um, a child guide they had one day asked, uh, Paul, does, does she have a separate camera for photographing legs? <laughs> because she just, there were these beautiful, sturdy legs that were unclothed, and um, she just really was interested in photographing them. Again, a child posing in front of a camera. This is off of a proof sheet of hers that I looked through, and then out into the countryside. Um, this is another photograph by my dad. This is uh, Dorothea putting together her show for MoMA, um, which she did not live to see. She did live to complete it, but did not, was not no longer alive a few months later when it opened. Um, here she is on the phone. This is, this is a row of photographs that she's taking a look at the possibilities of putting these together. So this is me with Dorothea when I was about 12. Uh, Dorothea lived maybe another couple years after this photograph was taking, taken. We all had very fancy Thanksgivings and Christmases together. 
Uh, my editor calls this the Rick Rack Princess shot. <laughs> we really did dress like this, which was fine, except when we went down into the nearby park to run around and play. We used to get pretty teased by the other kids. But we had these beautiful, elaborate family rituals that Dorothea put together. So I started working on that, and meanwhile, Diana starts uh, working on the film. So I'm living with my 96-year-old dad right now, and so what we did is we took over the entire downstairs of his huge house. We told my husband to stay out of the way. My, one of my kids and his wife lived there with us, too. And Diana set it up so that she could do those interviews that you saw earlier were all done here in this living room. So we all prepped for each of our interviews, and all the lights were rearranged, and the backgrounds changed. Here's Diana with her camera photographing. She's been doing this for decades. You can really tell by the way she's just really won with her camera. So she then gets busy in the editing room, and I get busy trying to arrange the photographs. And I'm lucky enough to have a room that I had my husband make me bulletin board. Three sides of this room are bulletin boards. The other side is windows. So I started pinning up photographs to try to be able to visualize how to put together this photography book. And at first it was very, very chaotic. You know, I was like, well, maybe this and this, or maybe this and this. And then gradually I started working on the page spreads, seeing what I could come up with, trying out different things, and seeing how the flow went from the beginning of the photographs you look at till the end. And then I finally got to my place where it was time to just stand back and contemplate, see where I was going with it. Finally, I had what I really loved and felt really did Dorothea justice. So I turned it in to Chronicle Books and said, OK, here's all my photographs. Now, they have a really cool thing. They have, this is a light box. When you look at photographs, you, anything printed, but if, if you're looking at photographs, you're really much more affected by the light source than you realize. This is room we went in this little room. This is the production designer. We went in this little room, closed the door, and then they turned on the light, and the lights are left, right, and top, so that you have a complete surround of the same kind of light. And then the production designer began going over each photograph to make sure we had exactly what we wanted. This is a photograph uh, from Pakistan, 1958. Um, that shows you a couple of really cool things. Um, one thing is how, this is like the proof sheet they sent me to say, what you turned in is on the one side there, the duller one, and then this one that's on you, your right, this is how the production designer um, made this photograph uh, easier to read. She clarified it, because I was working off a little bit of a muddy print, and this had not been um, ever publicly seen before, and I was determined to use it. You see how the arm and the hand are much more available? You can see them. They come out a little more clearly. The thing that I absolutely love about this photograph is Ten years ago, this wouldn't be that meaningful a photograph to us. But now, we've had a lot of information about burqas and some of the social meaning, the religious meaning, it, it, you know, the whole meaning in terms of gender. So we bring a lot to this photograph now that ten years ago this photograph wouldn't have meant to us. So that's why I was just so determined to put it in. Because it's just, I mean, this is not just a burqa. This is someone who's in abject poverty. You know, just little holes torn in for the eyes. But this, I guess this is her only item of clothing. You know, it's so filthy. So that was like what, what Chronicle Books was able to do to make this into just a book that could really resonate and just really pop. And so finally, they take all that. They, take it over to Singapore, they print it, and then finally, my copy of the book arrives in the mail one day. And that's a, a glorious, glorious day, let me tell you. The first thing I did was give it to my dad. 
So because he had been her assistant, and because Dorothea is very, very important to him to this day, I really hoped he would like the book. So he sat, and he went through it page by page by page. When he finished, he looked at me and goes, I think this is the best book on Dorothea Link ever. Yes. <laughs> you know, that was my one critic I was worried about. Because my dad will tell the truth. <laughs> so if he didn't like it, he was going to tell me. And I knew that. So here's Dorothea shortly before my before she died. This is my dad's photograph of her. Another one of the ways she dressed for our holidays. And I'll leave you with that photo, and I would be happy to take questions now. about how long your um, relative worked on the film? Yes. How long yeah. did you work at writing your, your book? Much shorter than mm -hmm. Diane. <laughs> I'm telling you, I would never make a film compared to doing a book. It's so, you know, her film issues were incredible and a lot of technology, you know, sound quality and stuff like that. Um, I would say this book, um, probably took me about a year. Um, I was under a lot of pressure, actually, because uh, we were moving really fast. Because once I... Oh. Here we go. Is that better? Can you hear me better? One, great. Once, um, once I started working on it, the, you know, the, the lag on a book is that you get the book finished and really they want to have minimum a year before it's in the store and available because, you know, when they send to Singapore to print, they send it back by boat. They don't fly it back because paper is super heavy, actually. So I was suddenly under a great deal of pressure to just really push through. And the editor I work with, who was tremendous, started uh, giving me sections of the Part that I was writing to it. Like, I want this by next Friday. I want this by the three weeks from now. Um, and I was just like sweating it, trying to get this stuff done. And when my husband took a look at the book, he's like, hey, this is actually a really long essay. I'm like, oh, that's why it was, it was so hard to write. Because, you know, I, I sort of lost track of time in there. Easy to do. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. You are the goddaughter yes. of Dorothea. Yes. And when did she die and how old was she? Okay, uh, she died in 1965, and uh, she, uh, she was only 70 years old. Oh, my. Yeah, she died of cancer. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Six, uh, 65. In, in 1965, and yes. she was 70 years old. Okay, yeah. thank you. It was a tremendous loss for our family. I mean, as you can see, she was a very intense person, and she was our matriarch. <laughs> we lived our life according to Dorothea's rules. Yep. And who has uh, possession of her negatives? Yeah. How are they being preserved? Yes, uh, the possession of Dorothea Lang's negatives. Um, the Library of Congress has the work she did uh, for the Farm Security Administration, so the Great Depression work. And then the National Archives has the war relocation work on the Japanese-American internment. Everything else that's not covered by those two are owned by the Oakland Museum. And they do have a really good cold storage facility where they keep stuff. Have they uncensored all of her stuff from the internment? Yeah, great question. Have they uncensored all of Dorothea's work from the internment? Yes, they have. Yeah, they have. Um, and it'll be interesting to see if this film can cre help create some interest in them, because they're such beautiful photographs. Mm -hmm. Yes? You said in your children's book um, about Dorothea Lang that there were times you were a little frightened of her. Could mm -hmm. you tell us a few stories about that? Yeah, Dorothea was tough. She was definitely tough. Like you saw from the beginning of the film where she said, where she said to Diana, yes, but do you see them? Um, so I was afraid of that side of her. Uh, 
Diana was different. She'd kind of go in for it, you know, because she's more confrontational than me. Um, so let me see if I can give you an example of, um, okay, so there is, um, if, I believe I put it in the book where she, you know, she would say there was always a way you were expected to behave. So when she would say, uh, you know, to herself, not good enough, Dorothea, not good enough, as she looked at her photographs, she would say to the rest of us, what have you done today? And she did not excuse children from this. <laughs> what have you done today? You were expected to be living an accountable life, even as a child. Um, and of course, because this was a very political family, um, I remember being snagged one time by Paul, who was a very loving man, and a you know, great piece of my heart goes to him. Paul snagged me one day, and he said, well, what do you think about the blah, 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 of some political thing that had happened? And I was like 10 or 11. And I was like, well, you know, I was watching a Parcheesi game getting set up. I was like, well, I don't really know what happened. And he goes, the trouble with you kids today is you don't know anything about the New Deal. <laughs> I was like, oh, glad. I have to say, once I finally met a farmer in Tennessee who said to me, oh, that TVA, that Tennessee Valley Authority, that was terrible. I was like, what? I mean, it never occurred to me that anybody was against rural electrification. <laughs> Any more questions? Why was he against uh, TV? Yeah. You know, I, I think I was so shocked. I, I didn't ask him too many questions, but he was a farmer who owned a lot of land, and I think his feeling was that it kind of just democratized stuff too much because then any little farm could have electricity. I don't know. I, I, I was I had something against high waters. waters. Yeah. High waters yeah. and telephone. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, that might have been part of it. That might have been part of it. But he might have been just trying to get a rise out of you. Yeah. <laughs> he might have been trying to get a rise out of me because it's easy to do with me, I have to admit. I'm, I'm pretty gullible for that kind of thing. What can you tell us about um, her, Dorothea's childhood and background that brought her to that um, commitment that everybody needed to contribute? Mm -hmm. Several things happened in her childhood that were difficult. One was getting the polio when she was seven, and um, they'd, she'd be walking down the street with her mother and they'd see someone coming they knew, and her mother would say to her, now walk as well as you can, Dorothea, which really stung because Dorothea was always walking as well as she could, obviously, and the kids at her school became her limpy. So that's gonna put a big dent in your personality and make you aware of difficulties that people have since you're experiencing them yourself. Also, her dad, when she was 12 or 13, her father abandoned the family. And they went from living in a beautiful house on the corner, because her dad was a lawyer, to her mother, uh, Dorothy, and her little brother, they moved in with um, Sophie, who was uh, Dorothea's grandmother. And um, Dorothea began having to take the ferry into New York City from Hoboken and uh, going to a big uh, public school where she said she was the only non-Jew in a school of 3,000. Um, maybe that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but she was an outsider there. And so she had a lot of things that dented her, and because of her resolve, she came out wanting to make things better rather than feeling victimized by it. One more question, maybe, and then we should probably wrap it up. What's your favorite picture of Dorothea's? Oh. <laughs> really, do I have to choose one? Oh, um, what's your least favorite? How about that? <laughs> you know, I have to honestly say it depends on my mood. 
although I have, when, my, when Dorothea was doing her, her um, show at MoMA, she was getting her prints um, developed by this guy named uh, Welsher in San Francisco. And my dad was there doing some work, and he was leaving out the back door, and there were a couple of prints in the garbage can, and he pulled them out and brought them home. And my sister ended up with one, I ended up with the other, they're photographs of Dorothea. I have a print about that big that apparently didn't meet the standards Welsher was looking for of Japanese grandfather with the grandson on his shoulders during the internment, and I have it right over my desk. And they're like my friend. They're like, I greet them every day as I sit down to work. Um, they're just like woven into my DNA at this point. So I would have to say that's probably my big, most favorite. Thank you all very much, and we're going to have a wrap-up.